Welcome back to Cinema Flicks and Music Picks. Sam Davey, your host with the most, the beast with the least. And the least we can do today is do a half hour on the Oscars controversy about Will Smith, Jada Pinkett and Chris Rock. I mean, personally, I don't think that assault can ever be excusable. However, you have to take into account certain circumstances that... Sweep says that that's kind of passe now and we're all over it. He said it is the 1st of uh, April, you're right. Just talking about the stuff I bought in the last month. Okay, well, it's good as ideas any. I do that every month anyway, so why not? Sorry. Well, uh, thanks to Sweep, we're, we're having a, a vault face and we'll, we'll do a haul video then or a pickups video or however the kids want to classify them these days. So, what have we picked up this month? <laughs> Amazingly, I've just got a bundle sitting here, almost as if that was the plan all along and never really cared about the old Will Smith thing. Although I'm definitely Dean Chris Rock. Mostly because Jada, Jada Pinkett and Oscars, that's the first time anybody's ever heard those two words in the same sentence. Alright, let's go for a wee bundle here. Should you start at the beginning, the end, or the weird? Yeah, I think we know the answer to that. The weird. So let's go to to sleep so as to dream. New from our old video. And this I watched the other night and it is completely batshit insane and completely wonderful. So it's private detectives looking for an actress um, who is trapped in the film itself of a silent ninja film, um, which from the 1910s, um, they're in the 1950s. So it's got a bit of that Purple Rose of Cairo thing, you know, with uh, the Woody Allen movie with Jeff Daniels and Mia Farrow. Um, it's got a bit of... Um, uh, Pleasantville, but it's also got film noir, it's got silent movies obviously, and it's a really great detective movie in its own right. Um, it's illusion, so you know, magical things happening, but illusion, so it's making allegories and, and probably a lot of things that are um, 1980s Japan centric. But we can appreciate thanks to the typical plethora of extras that our video bestow upon us luckily every month. So, yeah, I've been mean, here, for example, audio commentary with Japanese film experts Tom Mez and Jasper Sharp, and Os uh, audio commentary, Oscar commentary, <laughs> and we've had enough of that, with uh, director Kaiso Mayashi and lead actor uh, Shiro Sano. Um, Shiro Sano, some of you may remember, uh, recently was in, um, recently, semi-recently, uh, Shin Godzilla. Um, so, yeah, and, um, yeah, this is just, it's, it's, I want to say it's, it's, it's odd and bizarre, but in its world it makes perfect sense. It's got, so in that regard, this overused term, it's almost lynching, and that if you're in tune with this style of filmmaking, and the director, then it will make sense. It might take a couple of goes. Um, and I think it's a film that will reward uh, repeats. Um, but certainly, it's something a bit special. Hajima Mashti. Oh wait, that's, is that not hello? Oh, welcome to the collection, I suppose. Next up, we have um, classic horror. We have uh, slightly past their best. We have House of Long Shadows, one of these kind of been out in a million cheapo editions. I mean, you can see there Peter Cushions, hmm. it wouldn't be long before he'd retire. John Carradine wouldn't be long before he's dead, he kind of looks at that. Uh, Vincent Price from hmm, yeah, a few years left, and Chris Lee became as big a star as ever thanks to Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and the like. 
Um, but yeah, this is um, the Pete Walker film from 1981, I want to say, something like that. 83, sorry. So, oh, Christ, they're even older. Um, I was giving them an extra two years then. Sorry, guys. Um, it's fun. You get you get those guys um, in a, a deserted house, and you know, a young uh, couple come to stay there, and the strange goings on. I mean, it's nothing you haven't seen from these old guys before in their heyday, and then a million, you know, kind of knockoffs. Um, but it's a good restoration. It's got an audio commentary from Pete Walker and Derek Pickett. Uh, Pete Walker's House of Horror, um, House of the Long Shadows Revisited, um, new artwork from Graham Humphreys, not his best work I don't think, um, and it says double sided poster which I thought, oh good because at least I'll get the original theatrical poster which I much prefer, hmm, hmm, not too happy with this double sided poster, first of all the paper stock is atrocious, well, let's see, so here's our New artwork, okay. Yeah, we can all we can all agree on this. And the double sided is our new artwork, but with the credits at the bottom. No. No 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 no. We want two different posters. That's the point of the double sidedness. It's not just to remove the logos. So fabulous films you complete. Thank you for the film, but what you guys do with some of your other releases, like the A-Team that you have to take a mortgage on to own, and releasing you know one season of a TV show and then never releasing season two. Fabulous films have got the ultimate misnomer, but uh, they've done a good job in the disc, which is the main thing, so thank you Fabulous. I look forward to your next fuck up. Um, where to next? Anthony Hopkins from Wales, to one of actor, Tony Hopkins. Um, so this is um, magic, and there's Anthony Hopkins there. Oh wait, that. there's Anthony Hopkins there. Yeah, I see young Tony Hopkins when he was uh, fresh out of the, uh, the film version of um, uh, All Creatures Great and Small, Fat Fans. Um, so this is, um, if you've ever seen Dead of Night, it's, it's the, the classic, uh, ventriloquist dummy and you know who controls who, who's the real puppet master but it's just ridiculously well made I mean it stars Tony Hopkins it's directed by Richard Attenborough so you ain't talking about B-movie quality here and um, we've also got Anne Margaret Burgess Meredith um, so you know everybody on here is like an A-list name taking it 100% seriously which helps to sell it completely um, it could be a ridiculous film, and it is a ridiculous premise, but luckily, this takes it seriously. So the Dead of Night in 1945, that great British uh, classic, um, and and this lives up to that. Um, so, yeah, so Corky, the magician, played by, by Tony Hopkins, finds success with a ventriloquist act, and that's Fats, who's his dummy. Um, he, the pressure gets uh, the better of him and in a panic he flees the city back to the security of his hometown and then he, he finds an old flame and hmm child's play took a bit of inspiration from magic I think just putting that out there I'm not going to spoil what happens but yeah uh, one more and then we'll jump into a triple header some music I'm just, uh, picking them kind of randomly here uh, the Velvet Underground reunion album from 1992 this is the concert film of it, um, so it's it's the Velvet. So you've got Lou Reed, John Cale, Mo Tucker, and Sterling Morrison. Um, Nico was obviously dead by then, so she couldn't attend that evening. Um, so her songs, like Venus and Furs, are done by John Cale, and to hear him singing, um, is tomorrow's parties on this or just on the album? Yeah, it's just on the album, but he does um, all tomorrow's parties on the album. Sorry, it's not on this, um, but he does Venus and Furs on this. And it's so good. It's so good. Uh, and Femme Fatale, sorry, he does Femme Fatale. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, so you get Venus and Furs, White Light, White Heat, Beginning to See the Light, which is beautiful. Uh, Some Kind of Love, Femme Fatale, Hey Mr. Wren, Mo Tucker gets her little centerpiece, I'm sticking with you. I heard a common name. I'll be your memory. 
rock and roll sweet jane i'm waiting for my man and heroin pale blue eyes and coyote um so yeah this is cool get it to this cd if you like it though because it's got the stuff that ain't on this because this was broadcast for tv looks kind of bootlegged though doesn't it it's almost you know really cheap packaging but uh is what it is and you know that banana was uh, pretty successful for them wasn't it have a banana the old cockney rhyming slang uh triple headers just to battle through them Endless Journey, the story of The Who, uh, great documentary about The Who I've seen on TV. Uh, this version adds um, six quick ones while she's away, um, digging more deeply in, um, so more footage and, you know, the usual kind of thing. And then um, a Railway Hotel performance from 1964, so we're talking about a year before they, they even had a hit. Uh, the earliest known footage of them in existence um, in a scrapbook of, of uh, extras. The runtime of the film is uh, two hours and then two hours for the bonus features. Um, yeah, so it's fantastic. To accompany that, we have The Who, Maximum R&B Live. Um, so this is The Who on stage from 65 to 89. It's um, kind of one of those compilation -y things where it just takes, you know, the best of certain performances that are quite famous. Um, so we, some of this was from uh, that had already been concerts that had already been used and the kids are all right and things. Um, but we have like um, from the Richmond Jazz and Blues, we have any, Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere. Um, from the Marquee in 67, we've got So Sad, I won't go through everything, but we've got um, uh, Top of the Pops, we've got stuff from the Netherlands, and correct label here is Holland, um, we've got Sh uh, Shepperton Studios, we've got stuff from, from uh, the recording of Tommy, um, we've got Giant Stadium, we've got Shea Stadium 1982, we've got Disc 2 is the entire Rock Palace 1981 show, um, which by that point, Kenny Jones was the drummer because Keith Moon, like Nico, was dead by that point, so was unable to attend that evening. Now, I did mention Shea Stadium 1982. 1982 is on blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's perhaps not everybody's favourite year of the Who. The albums weren't quite as great by this point, were they? Let's be honest. Pete's solo albums were probably better than the Who ones. Um, but you still get a great set list, if nothing else. Um, so you get Substitute, Can't Explain, Dangerous, Sister Disco, Quiet One, It's Hard, Eminence Front, Behind Blue Eyes, Bubba Riley, I'm One, Punk and the Godfather. Drowned, Tattoo, Cry If You Want, Who Are You, Pinball Wizard, See Me Feel Me, Love Rain Or Me, Long Live Rock, Won't Get Filled Again, Young Man Blues, Naked Eye, I Saw Her Standing There, The Who Covering The Beatles, Summertime Blues, and Twist and Shout, which yeah, we're not going to count that as The Who Covering The Beatles because that was already a cover, but you know, whatever. And then bonus tracks, Substitute, Can't Explain, My Generation, Man Is A Man, and 515. This is a really good performance. It might not be your lineup of The Who, you might like the classic quartet, but pff, it's The Who, man. It's The Who from, from somewhere near the peak will do for me. Uh, in a video not too long ago, I picked up Martin Scorsese's Journey Through American Cinema. Um, he did a companion piece um, where he celebrates the films of his parents' homeland in my journey to Italy, where Scorsese does the same. He sits in a room and analyzes the films of uh, Lucio Visconti and uh, Roberto Rossellini, Vittorio De Sica, uh, Federico Fellini, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni. I think I went a bit Italian in some of those pronunciations. Antonioni. Um, so, you know, it goes into stuff like Humberto D and the Bicycle Thieves, of course, but then, and then La Dolce Vita, eight and a half, but then slightly more obscure things, uh, you know, like maybe Rossellini's Flowers of St. Francis or or Paisan or maybe Visconti's um, uh, Senso, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not just uh, the leopard and, you know, the big Italian films that 
any kind of world cinema, cinephile knows. Um, so that's an NFL. Um, but yeah, Martin Scorsese is just a treasure trove of information as always. Next up, I'll grab a bundle. What do we have here? Ah, recently covered, picked this up as a joke because it was a pound and it is Status Quo's Beulah Co which I can't remember why I thought this was funny one night I put it in Upside Down it probably sums the movie up I've not watched it yet, I've not plucked up the courage but the novel is kind of worn off now and, yeah. I'll get right to it <laughs> this is a recommendation that I had years ago from a few people and people that I trust like Brian Sauer from Just The Discs included it in a lot of his recommendations when it came out. It's now out of print but somebody sold it on eBay for the princely sum of 10 of your British pounds kissed by the Queen herself. Um, it is Hey Candy Tangerine Man shoot a pin for me and uh, a double bill because you get uh, oh i think i just showed you the next movie there didn't whoops jesus um you get lady coco um as the uh, as the next one um so these are both directed um by uh matt K kimber matt kimber matt K Kim matt kimber if you just say it with confidence people believe you're right Definitely directed by Matt Kimber, see? Um, and if you prefer Lady Coco to Kangerine Man, Candy Tangerine Man, you get a reversible cover where you can switch them. But um, since it was Lady, since it was Candy Tangerine Man that was really recommended to me, I've kept it as that. Um, this is fun black exploitation stuff. Um, it's not up there to me with your real classics, your coffees and to me, you're Ray really Moore's. Um, but as it mentions in the back, a favorite of Tarantino and Samuel L. Jackson. I'm pretty sure they just brought it up in an interview for uh, Jackie Brown and moved on, but hey. So yes, I think you probably caught a glimpse of the next one. Out of print and hard to get because of uh, certain acquisitions by the House of Mouse recently. Um, but this is better anyway, because it doesn't have the Twilight-esque cover where they tried to they went back and photoshopped a cover to try and capitalise on Twilight in the late 2000s um, and make this look like a, an Edward and Bella love story. It is Captain Bigelow's Near Dark with Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxson at Al. Um, I love this film a bit, it's always have. It's grimy as hell. It's, I mean, to, tr to try and say that this is anything even remotely like uh, Twilight is such a misnomer. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's a, a romantic subplot, but in the in the context of being a disgustingly grimy, horrible, almost post-apocalyptic um, um, vampire movie, um, which you know came out in that, that uh, same year as The Lost Boys, I think, and that's always stolen quite a lot of its thunder. But to me, this is a much better film because it's a it's a much more adult look, whereas The Lost Boys to me always comes off as like the Goonies, uh, you know, it's much more childish than, than uh, Near Dark, which is, you know, Catherine Bigelow was obviously married to James Cameron at the time, and to me this is kind of like what James Cameron would have done with the vampire movie. Um, this is easily available in Germany, if you're still looking for a copy, don't pay big scalpers prices for the Twilight cover, um, go to Germany and get the media book where you know looks lovely and it won't set you back too much at all so plus Lance Henriksen man's bishop who doesn't love Lance Ugh, another wee bundle <laughs> another wee bundle my poor back what me where am I back uh, after love I haven't watched this yet I'm afraid but I know Joanna Scanlon's getting a lot of praise for her performance in it including um, beating Lady Gaga to an Oscar and uh, Oscar to a BAFTA and things um, and good for her because Joanna Scanlon is one of the best things on British telly for a long, long, long time. Um, so the unexpected death of her husband, uh, Mary Hussein, 
um, is tidying her th his things in their Dover home. She stumbles upon a secret connection he had across the channel to Calais. Um, so it's a, a white woman who's you know converted to to, to uh, become a Muslim and, and and whatnot, and the trouble that that's causing her life is explored, uh, from what I know, and then the trouble that secrets and lies, to quote another kind of good uh, British movie, has um, has led to even after after love, <laughs> if you will. But yeah, Joanna Scanlon. So I'm looking forward to seeing this. I'm really looking forward to it, but. Not enough hours in the day. Back to some music. We've got our, yeah. We all came down to Montreux to see Johnny Cash at Montreux. Um, this was 1994, I want to say. Yes, 1994. Um, and so this would have been just after his Rick Rubin American recordings first came out. So it's not the really decrepit, hurt Johnny Cash. And he was only 73 there. People always think he was like 100. He was only 73. Um, but yeah, this is 10 years earlier, so he's still got a bit of vibrancy. Um, it does the hits, as you'd imagine, Folsom and Get Rhythm and Ring of Fire. But then he does do quite a bit from the American Recordings album, because he does Delia, oh Delia, and Never Was a Horse Like the Tennessee Stud. Um, Bird in a Wire, The Beast in Me, the Nick Lowe song. Um, Big River, Jackson, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, Orange Blood, Orange, oh, aren't you glad I'm not a banana? Orange, Orange Blossom Special. Orange Blossom Special. Well, I slipped up on Tangerine Man and now I'm slipping up on oranges. Clearly not meant for citrus. And the next time I'm in town is the encore. But we'll stay in Montreux, but we'll jump back in time. Right, right back, actually. Um, in fact, one of them is the same year, this two, so maybe they bumped into each other backstage. It is my namesake, it is Mr. Gallagher, but he's Rory M. David. So, yeah, one of the great guitar players of all time. Great singer as well, an underrated singer compared to his guitar playing. Um, to me, when people say, um, uh, oh, I, I never like what Clapton did after, you know, going solo and things. I always say, do you listen to Rory Gallagher? No. Like, listen to Rory, he's doing the stuff that you want, trust me. Um, or, and Gary Moore to a certain extent, depending on the era. Um, but this disc is insane. It's got 1975, 77, 79, 85, the whole set from 94, and then bonus tracks from 75 and 77 and 85 on this too. So just to run through a couple of the tracks, because I mean, it's, it's absolutely jam-packed if you want to look at that. Uh, see if that, yeah, a bit better. Uh, Tattooed Lady, yeah, Garbage Man Craig, rock, Tore Down Laundromat, Laundromat Blues, it should be, Calling Card, Secret Agent, uh, Pistol Slapper Blue, Shin Kicker, Last of the Independent, Too Much Alcohol, hmm. Ominous, by Penny, Moonchild, Philby, you know, Continental Lot, Moonchild again, Tattered Lady, Could Have Had Religion, I love Could Have Had Religion, um, I don't think it does go into my hometown on it, but I love that track, it's one of my favourite road tracks, um, and, um, oh, is that the one I'm thinking of? Um, um, messing with the kids on here, isn't it? Must be. Yeah, there it is. Messing with the kids. Walking Blues. I'm ready. Uh, Western Plain. Going to my hometown. Western Plain. Walking Blues. Yeah. So. And I love um, Asian Blues as well. That's a great track. Yeah. Rory. Much missed. Much missed. Yeah. Proud performances as well. The great thing about the Montreux DVDs is Claude always had really professional setups. So whenever you buy one, you ain't going to be taking a risk. If the performer is putting in the performance, Claude is getting the audio and visual correct. So you don't need to worry about anything else. We can put Johnny Cash down um, and jump back to some horror with Arrow. Arrow video again. And um, Ken Branagh's Frankenstein. Frankenstein, uh, with um, Robert De Niro's waiting, he's not got a brain. Um, so this is you know, Mary Shelley's uh, Dracula, 
it's a bit more faithful in some versions, but it's still not Mary Shelley's. Did I say Mary Shelley's Dracula? That's <laughs> Bram Stoker's Dracula was Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, this is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is not faithful to Dracula at all. It's nothing like it. Um, but it's not as faithful as some people, including Ken Bran at the time, like to kind of make it out to be. Um, it does still take quite a few liberties, but it picks up on some beats that hadn't often been done. The monster's more intelligent. Um, it cuts out a lot of stuff like you know going to Scotland and getting arrested in Ireland. And, you know, it's a, the novel's like a world tour. It's this bizarre thing if you've only seen the movies. Um, so this is the new era, which is also 4K, but I didn't really need to get 4K. But it's not like it's not a great movie, but you know I do like it. But, um, it does have plenty of extras as always. Brand new commentary by Michael Brook, um, who often works for Indicator, but. Here he is here, and Johnny Main's brand new interview with the composer Patrick Doyle, costume designer James Aitchison, uh, interview with makeup designer Daniel Parker, um, a new documentary feature on the origins and evolution of Frankenstein, featuring uh, David Peary, Jonathan Rigby, Jonathan Rigby, he's on all the Hammer DVDs that you've got. Uh, and Stephen Volk on the differences between the novel and the adaptation. Just listen to me, don't listen to Jonathan Rigby. Um, Frankenstein, uh, I keep saying, it's because I'm so used to young, Franken, young Frankenstein. Um, a literal, a, a liberal, I'm so tongue tied today. I should not be sniffing so much glue before I make these videos. A liberal adaptation from Mary Shelley's famous story for Edison production. That's the actual title. Frankenstein, a liberal adaptation from Mrs. Shelley's famous story for Edison production. <sighs> kind of makes Marani's Black Bottom sound like it rolls off the tongue. That's from 1910. It's the first version of Mary Shelley's story on the screen. Um, as you can imagine, with only 10 minute runtime. That's not terribly faithful either. But um, yeah, that emerged a few years ago. It was long lost. But uh, yeah, here it is. So yeah, it's a cool disc. If, if something was on it like new stuff with, with Brana or De Niro, I'd definitely have gone for the 4K, but uh, it's just not a great movie. It's just it's, it's good, but it's not great. Okay, here's a wee bundle we can just go right through, actually. Don't even need to talk about any of these, because I made a whole separate video on them. It's this month's Indicator Bundle. It's Mad Dog Morgan, which I highly recommend. Um, it's nearly sold out as well, even though it's just been released. So if you want your indicator Dennis Hopper collection in limited editions, then you better be fast. Um, you know, to go with uh, Nightsides and uh, the last movie. Uh, A Time for Dying, which I did watch last week. Um, and it isn't Bud Bodeker's best movie, far from it. But then, that's a high standard, so I shouldn't be too down on it. Um, and it, the, the Kim Newman piece on the various versions of Jesse James, very interesting, as you'd expect from, from Kim Newman. La Llorona, you can watch the previous video that I did on this indicator haul to just see me just <laughs> over that because I was so excited over it, it was so good. And Phantom of the Monastery, which... Uh, it's unkind to say that it's not as good as La Llorona because La Llorona was such an experience, such a wonderful surprise that for this to not live up to it, why should it? It's not this movie's fault that it's not a complete masterpiece. It's still very strong. It's just not quite as good as La Llorona. But I think you should pick them up as a pair. Two of a perfect pair. Um, speaking of a pair, what a pair. Um, this came as uh, one of the same guy that was selling the Vinegar Syndrome at a print stuff, also had this for a tenner. And I'd picked up the Andy Milligan box set from uh, Vinegar Syndrome, uh, seven? Seven last year. Vinegar Syndrome? Whoever. Maybe I put it out. Um, and it doesn't include these two, but I've got it now. So, seeds and vapors. So, um, <laughs> When your first special feature is um, Seeds of Sin, alternate feature sex exploitation version. It's probably not one for the kids, although I think they'd enjoy it anyway. Um, 
And the second one's pretty much a, a light, a light gay porno. <laughs> um, where not much happens, but there's a lot of subtext. Um, Andy Milligan's a fascinating filmmaker because he's kind of the Ed Woods um, of uh, queer cinema who thought he was really, really great. So Edward might not have really thought he was that good, but he was plucky and, you know, was going to get better. Andy Milligan always thought he was, you know, up to Shakespeare's snuff when it came to making these productions. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, an interesting double bill. Um, yeah. I can't recommend them to anyone because I think you'd need to experience some Andy Milligan first. Um, Look at some of his filmography on IMDb and just the titles alone will tell you if you want to check out Andy Milligan. So from a cult horror person who, not horror, but a cult filmmaker who I can't recommend to everyone, here's someone who I do recommend to everyone. A lost film found, oh my goodness, from The Master, from George Romero, it is The Amusement Park. That's right, that's right. Um, this is a film about aging and how we treat the elderly. Um, I believe he was um, contracted to do it in between, was it um, Season and the Witch and uh, Dawn of the Dead? Was, or The Crazies and Dawn of the Dead? It was that period, like between, dawn, uh, between night and dawn. Yeah, <laughs> just like the idol box I called it. Um, so it's kind of between that, um, that era, um, and it was a thought lost in his filmography until he passed away, sadly, um, and his wife went through his affairs and found the film print, and so here we now have it in a 4K restoration, so it went from being completely lost to being, you know, completely found. <laughs> um, it's wonderful, it's not long, it is about an hour, isn't it? Yeah, 73 uh, 54 minutes, so it came out at 73 and it's less than an hour and it's absolutely terrifying it's got that Cronenberg-like what the hell is going on and why is this a, you know, he was commissioned to do this as a uh, almost like a PBS kind of thing, you know, like a, 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 pub, a public information thing but he ended up just making this really extreme movie <laughs> that's absolutely terrifying. As you can tell from the poster, kind of, you know, it's a real treatise on um, on uh, ageing and, and what it does to the mind, and it's kind of terrifying to see the way that these old people are treated and what's, you know, it tries to internal, uh, take what's happening internally and externalise that into the, the world. And I think it was just so bloody weird that it could never have really caught on, you know. But here it is, a lost... George Romero movie found and presented in beautiful quality. I believe it's out in the States. I got this one from France, so it's got a slight whiff of garlic and cheese and wine to it, but that's quite nice. Um, and you know, it's in a nice digi pack with the book, which is in French, but I speak very pidgin French, so at least I can understand about one eighth of it. Yeah. We're not staying in France, but we are dealing with a Canadian. Um, who lived for a while in the Canadian French provinces. We have Atom McGoin, um, who is of Lithuanian descent. Um, this is from Artificial Eye, you can always tell because the spines are upside down. <laughs> um, and it's recently been deleted because it's individual spines to be replaced by just one digipack, you know, fold out kind of thing better for the environment but horrible cover and they were selling this off dirt cheap I got this for 22 quid um, and it's got next of kin family viewing speaking parts the adjuster calendar exotica and probably his most successful film uh, the sweet hereafter with, uh, with Ian Holm there yeah. um, although my personal favorite from this is if we can find it here the Adjuster with uh, Mr. Elias Cateus is one of those actors who, speaking of Cronenberg a few minutes ago, he was in um, Crash, gave a stunning performance in that. He's one of those actors, if you employ him and give him something even remotely interesting to do, he makes it incredibly interesting. So, yeah, Elias Cateus, man. Yeah. Yeah. Next wee lot. 
Uh, not seen this one in years, but I remember it being good. Um, it's a bit like that show Brotherhood that was on a good few years ago with uh, Jason Clark and um, um, was it Jason Isaacs was it two Jasons, um, Sean Penn, Ed Harris, and Gary Oldman. Hello, Cindy. Um, State of Grace. So it's uh, a decade after leaving his old Irish American neighborhood, Terry Noonan is welcomed back to Hell's Kitchen. A one time street tough, he's now an undercover narc, uh, targeting the head of the old gang. So it's a little bit departed, even though The Departed was obviously a remake of Infernal Affairs. Um, it certainly got a lot of the vibe of this as well by setting it in, um, you know, that, that Irish American background. I think The Departed kind of mixed Infernal Affairs and State of Grace. Um, it's a good movie. Um, Ed Harris gives a, an interview on it. Uh, I remember it being quite violent, but I've not seen it in a long time. Um, it does have that kind of 90s thing where things have a tendency to build up to, you know, a, a, a bit of a silly over the topic ending rather than, you know, allow things to progress naturally. But hey. The ABCs of Death, um, a modern uh, horror anthology, which anthologies are usually, um, you know, amicus and things, it'll be three parts or four parts. This is uh, 26, because it's one for every letter of the alphabet, so they're all very short, but you get a, an absolute plethora of great filmmakers. So you get, um, I mean, Ben Wheatley's on here, my favourite, but um, you get... Um, the guys that did uh, House of the Devil and Tokyo Gore Police, you're next. Hitman Kill List, obviously, has been weightly a Serbian film. If you've never seen that, <laughs> Hobo with a Shotgun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we've got some pretty guys that have gone on to have pretty big careers in the past, and girls have gone on to have pretty big careers in the past few years, really. Uh, looking through them all, but uh, yeah, like John Schnapp and. Uh, Ty West, Ben Whitley, Adam Wingard, I mean, Chris. He's directing blockbusters now. Uh, feature length documentary, I should have bundled this with the other one, but feature length documentary about Rory Gallagher. And you get the uh, 1971 Beat Club sessions and 72. Um, so in that he does Laundromat, Hands Up Center Boy, Should Learn My Lesson, Crest of an Eve, Tore Down, Pistol Slapper, Don't Know Where I'm Going, Going to My Hometown, Could Add Religion, Hoodie Man, Messing With a Kid. So a couple of taste tracks in there as well. Um, and this is Rory's formative years, uh, right through a taste, his solo career. Um, and uh, it, it, it's it's um, full of interviews with some really interesting people like um, Bill Wyman's on here I think and Cameron Crowe, um, The Edge, um, uh, Johnny Marr who you wouldn't imagine was particularly inspired by, by Rory but he's on here um, and yeah and there he is as a wee, a wee bairn look probably doing his skiffle there doing his Lonnie Donegan yeah. I love too. Now I can't remember the name of this one in English, but you'll remember it if you've seen it. Um, really, ought to Kurt Russell, Madeline Stowe, in Fatal Bijard. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of this one. Deadly something maybe if it's Fatal. Um, but this was another staple in the nineties on TV. It's the one where Kurt Russell um, and Madeline Stowe are a married couple, and their house gets broken into. Um, and uh, he doesn't act, he's kind of frozen stiff and really Ott is the detective who comes to sort things out and then Madeline Stowe kind of takes it out on Kurt Russell as if like, he's been emasculated by not standing up for his woman going back to the Oscars um, <laughs> yeah, forget that, cheap <laughs> but not beneath me funnily enough um, so he says to really Ott's character Maybe I can do a, you know, ride along with you and we'll, we'll get this creep and I'll prove that I'm a man. Hmm, he's making a deal with the devil there because really ought to be a bit, hmm, hmm. It's part of that kind of subgenre of if you let that third party into your lives, you might find that they don't want to leave again. Uh, Pacific Heights was another one with Michael Keaton and Andy Garcia, I think, was in that one too. Um, good movie. Good movie. Just if I can remember the name of it. Oh well. Yeah.
not not many left here because the last wee bits of bundle um the remake of nightmare alley a few months ago um i picked up the original um but here's the Guillermo del Toro remake complete with abysmal photoshop touched up cover where everybody's made of wax and plastic I hate that why not just use their faces it's a film noir um, yeah this this will come out from Criterion or something one day because there's no way a good top Guillermo del Toro movie is going to come out with just a short neo-noir doc featurette beneath the tarp and um, another feature. I mean, the film is a good two and a half hours long, but it doesn't feel it. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, this is now a neo noir because the original was a noir, but this is now being made set in the contemporary era, um, and it's quite a different version. Um, so it was based on the novel by was it William Gersh? Gresham? Gresham? Gresham. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and. This one's a lot more sexualized, of course, because we're now out of the production code. Um, Kate Blanchett's sensational here. Um, if uh, if you want a masterclass on how to do the the femme fatale thing in a modern setting, even though the film's set in the you know in the past, b b but done contemporarily, Kate Kate Blanchett shows you how to do it perfectly here. Uh, Bradley Cooper's great as as um, a kind of every man you can imagine him being like a Ray Milan type who doesn't know what he's got gotten himself into, and then you've got Tony Collette from Hereditary, which I forgot the name of last time. I think it caught what did I call it? Um, Muriel's Wedding Two, Electric Boogaloo, <laughs> um, but um, Richard Jenkins, of course, who, who doesn't love Richard Jenkins, and he was obviously in The Shape of Water recently with. Uh, with Guillermo del Toro, uh, the old favourite of Guillermo, Ron Perlman is in this as well, Mary Steenburgen, the woman, the lucky woman who married Ted Danson. Everybody's, uh, you know, when they say, uh, he's my man crush, everybody's man crush, it doesn't matter your sexuality, you could be asexual and still have a crush on Ted Danson. David Strathairn, love David one of those actors should have been a major star. Yeah, it's just Rooney Mad is in here as well. It's packed full of great character actors and people who have done leading parts. So yeah, really, really good version and a great chance now that they're both out in recent months to pick up both versions and compare and contrast. Have a play about with what could and couldn't be done in both versions and read the novel. There you go. There's your homework. Stay. And then, from the same charity shop where I got status quo, this cut a bit close to the bone, but um, 1933 uh, Russian <laughs> invasion of Ukraine <laughs> um, with Mr. Jones, starring James Norton, Vanessa Kirby, and slave, very slimy looking Peter Sarsgaard. Um, so, this is. Um, Let's see when it was out. Um, well, it came out a few years ago, I think 2019. Yeah, 2019. Um, so it's also got uh, so Vanessa Kirby, Peter Sarsgaard, um, somebody plays George Orwell, isn't it? Uh, Joseph Mall, yeah. Ken Cranham's in here, so it's full of great character actors. Um, Gareth James Norton is an ambitious Welsh journalist who gained fame after his report on being the first foreign journalist. To travel uh, to fly with Hitler, uh, on leaving a government role, he decides to go to Moscow and do the same with Stalin. Uh, hearing murmurs of a, an induced famine in the Ukraine, he looks into and it's a kind of expose on that. Um, and Peter Sarsgaard is the journalist who kind of rides along with him from the states. Um, it's <laughs> it's good, but. I get it. I don't know if it needed to be a film. It feels very BBC TV like, and that's not helped by the fact that it even stars James Norton, a staple of BBC TV. But it doesn't feel like James Norton in a film. It feels like a film's come down to James Norton, and that's sad because he's a great actor. But it's filmed very flat in places. There's nothing particularly cinematic about it. It tells a great story, but it just feels like a BBC uh, mini series that was condensed into a film. Um, however, it is timely, and uh, 
a reminder that the people of the Ukraine have not had easy for an awfully long time. It's not just been since you know t the 2014 annexation of the Crimea. Um, so yeah, but let's end on a slightly happier note, shall we? So if you watched my f uh, film journey with Nathan Jones, and if you didn't, why not? Um, but if you watched that, you'll have seen that one of my early film memories was getting woken up by my dad in the middle of the night to watch Caddyshack. Um, and after that, um, I thought, I've not seen Caddyshack in a while, actually. I'll go back and rewatch it. And first of all, I fell in love with Rodney Dangerfield all over again. I've been listening to so many of his routines. Absolutely amazing. But then I thought, do you know what? I've not got any of the classic Chevy Chase stuff. Um, really, apart from Caddyshack. Um, so I picked up Fledge. I mean, I've seen them all, but I've not owned them. So I picked up Fledge, which I like, but what I much prefer is Fletch Lives, um, which I thought was a much funnier version. And it actually has got a lot of parallels to Knives Out when you watch this. There's a lot of parallels. You know, Fletch goes down south. Um, into, um, I think it even is. Well, it must be George. It's down the gun with the wind cover. Um, but you know, I, you know, gets involved in a kind of mystery down there. So there's a lot of parallels there. Although it must be said that uh, Fletch is no Benoit Blanc. You know, with the donut holes within donut holes. Why am I here? Who hired me? <laughs> That's my Daniel uh, Craig as Benoit Blanc. Who hired me? Um, and then. We can't talk, talk talk about Chevy Chase without vacation. You never go full Griswold, but you can go full Griswold here if you pick up the four movie collection. So I know there was millions and millions of sequels that nobody counts, like uh, Christmas Vacation Two, Cousin, Ed Cousin Eddie's Tropical Paradise, Christmas. Fuck off, all those cheap nineties ones. This is Vacation, the, the original. Uh, European Vacation, the second one, which was mm, yeah. Christmas Vacation, probably the most popular one in the lot. Um, and then Vegas Vacation, the kind of forgotten one. Um, so quite a few special features, but mostly on uh, the first film. Um, and Dennis Quaid's involved in quite a lot of them, which, what does that tell you? Must have been, these must have been made a while ago, because... Uh, Dennis Quaid has gone a lot further than uh, Phil Griswold. He's gone fucking loop, fruit loops. So yeah, it's, it's really uh, you know just compiling the individual discs and in one set. Nice cheap way to get them. This was seven pounds on your Amazon. So you know, for a, I think for I think to get this and the two Fletchers, it was about sixteen quid, and that's quite enough Chevy Chase when added to Caddyshack and Community. And even then, he was never my favourite thing in community. Donald Glover for the win. Anyway, that's about it for this month. There's been some other things like the Godfather box, but I've done videos on that. So watch my other videos, then watch them again. Tell your friends to watch them. Tell them to subscribe. Tell them to tell their friends in a kind of viral way. But you don't need to wear masks or have vaccines because you'll enjoy what's happening to you. Probably. Some people may prefer to catch infectious disease, but hmm. I lost a subscriber the other day, then made a new one, and then lost another one. So although I've, I've caught about, you know, 30 of yen in the past couple of weeks, losing that one kept me up. Yeah. If I lost two, I don't think it'd be so bad, but don't unsubscribe. But um, losing one, you kind of wonder, what was I did for that one person? Was it Marlon Brando's grandson or something? Or, you know, what's he doing these impressions of my grandfather for? It's not funny, it's not amusing. I don't see me. He doesn't even sound a mother like my grandfather. Sorry, Brando Jr. Jr. <sighs> anyway, life is a carnival. So, I'm um, also excited to say that as of Sunday, I shall be joining the wonderful crew of Sea of Tranquility, um, Pete Pardo's epic YouTube channel, um, which covers music and movies. Uh, they only do one movie show at the moment, but you know, 
if there's going to be more I'm pretty sorry for movies you probably guessed that from my and, and this is all music you know um, so as of Sunday it should it'll be definitely recorded on Sunday I don't know if it'll be posted on Sunday but there's going to be a new show um, about uh, physical media and collecting why we still do it and then we're going to show three musical pickups from the month um, be it um, CD, DVD, Blu-ray, um, T-shirt from a tour, you might, whatever it is, anything to do with music, just why we still celebrate physical media in this age of why don't you just Spotify it, why don't you just Netflix and, I was going to say Netflix and chill, but that's something a little bit different, why don't you just sell Netflix, that's on Britbox, you know, these kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm not going to give you an answer now because I'll give it on Pete's show. He gets my A material now. You people mean nothing to me. No, you're my favourites. You're the original crew. Never forget that. Never. Anyway, Friday evening, I'm sure you've got something better to do than watch me for any longer than 50 minutes. Break it up into two. Well, wait, I should have told you how to start, shouldn't I? You'll figure it out. So, do me a favour over the weekend, won't you? Try and be careful of them. Love and mercy, my dears. Love and mercy.